Let us wrap up the class by talking about the other externalities. To tell you the truth, market criticism is curious. Not only is the market criticized for the external costs that arise when too much is produced, like when pollution occurs, but the market is also criticized for being too successful. People find fault with the market when external benefits or positive externalities appear. Positive externalities appear when an entrepreneurial action benefits not only those directly involved in it, but also many other people who, it is pointed out, benefit from the action without paying for it. These people are called free riders. Again, the market is criticized. Listen, capitalism does not work because many actions serve not only those involved, but numerous other people as well. Response? So what? What is wrong with that? Every entrepreneurial action does in fact benefit many people besides those directly involved. No, that is unfair, and furthermore, it is inefficient. Those people do not pay, and therefore you are not taking into account the service you are providing them with, and you are producing too little. Where negative externalities, external costs, exist, it is said that too much is produced, and in the case of external benefits, it is said that too little is produced. You are not producing enough. To give you an idea, education is a clear example. If I get an education and I pay for my education, I am benefiting because I am becoming a more learned person. I am going to earn a higher wage, etc. But some say, your getting an education is not advantageous to you alone. It will also offer advantages to many other people you come into contact with. What does this mean? It means you are not spending enough on education. Therefore, Papa State has to come in and invest more in education. An entire theory of public goods has been developed. Its proponents theorize that whenever non-excludability exists, that is, whenever other people cannot be excluded from consumption, and there is non-rivalry in consumption, in short, whenever the free rider phenomenon occurs, there is a public good and they mention a lighthouse as a typical example of a public good. Lighthouses give out light. A lighthouse shines light and reveals the location of all boats, and anyone who passes by can see the light, whether or not he has paid for it. Such theorists say, a lighthouse is an example of a public good. Many people benefit from it without paying anything. So, obviously, no one is going to want to pay to build a lighthouse system because there will be no way of excluding free riders and charging them. Therefore, a lighthouse is a public good. The state must provide it. Education is a public good. The state must provide it. Defense is also a public good, and the state must provide it. If I build a nuclear umbrella, like the one Reagan created, we will all benefit from the umbrella, those who have paid and those who have not. It is then argued, Free riders will not want to pay for a nuclear umbrella defense system, and it will not be built. Therefore, the state must step in. Is this a sound or a plausible argument? No, it is not, dear students. Dynamically speaking, every apparently non-excludable and non-rivalrous public good creates incentives for people to find creative, entrepreneurial solutions for excluding non-payers. Such solutions may involve legal or technical innovations, etc. There is a classic article titled The Lighthouse in Economics, which was written by Ronald Coase, a winner of the Nobel Prize in Economics. I am not generally a fan of his, but in this particular article I am. Coase shows that the entire lighthouse system in the United Kingdom was privately financed, because in an environment of freedom, ways were found to exclude free riders through ship owners and fishermen's associations, and even the most obvious methods. Listen, England is a very boring country. It rains all day, and the only fun thing to do is to go to a pub and drink warm beer. Well, the mere threat of all your companions giving you the cold shoulder in the pub was enough to make you pay your fee to finance the lighthouse system. And the entire lighthouse system in the United Kingdom was private. Moreover, in an environment of freedom, technological innovations occur, such as GPS positioning systems and de-scramblers. People used to say television is a public good. What nonsense! What a ridiculous notion! Think of Canal Plus, Via Digital and other cable TV channels. The company installs a little device in your house, you pay a fee and others are excluded. 
as long as there is a political interest in it. And what about education? There is a huge joke in all of this. Some say, theoretically, in static terms, education is a public good, because it is non-excludable, and free riders benefit. Therefore, the state must intervene. How? How much? And how would we know if the state were intervening too much and spending inefficiently? Take a look at these classrooms in a public, state-owned university. 30% of students never come to class. Why? It does not matter to them. The opportunity cost is zero. Enrollment costs next to nothing. All education should be private, from the time children are small, as soon as they begin to have the use of reason, until they are adults. The public goods argument provides no justification for public education. Now we come to the definitive argument. And what about defense? Clearly defense is a public good, because otherwise, if we set up an anti-missile system... To hear this in Spain, where we kept the Roman legions in check for nearly a hundred years with guerrilla warfare, we Spanish people discovered guerrilla warfare, private warfare, and defense poses no problem. Look at countries like Switzerland. Practically all of the Swiss have a gun at home. And at the first sign of trouble, everyone is ready, and no one is getting in. Hitler never dared to set foot in Switzerland. So, the static phenomena of non-rivalry in consumption and non-excludability of free riders, when viewed from a dynamic perspective, give rise to incentives to discover the innovations necessary to make exclusion possible. Therefore, in dynamic terms, the set of public goods tends to be empty, and there is no scientific justification for the existence of the state.